On April 6, 1891, 15 Lombard women, led by Chicago attorney Ellen A. Martin, marched into their local polling place and demanded to vote. It was 29 years before the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution secured women's right to vote nationwide. Martin and her colleagues, all prominent Lombard women, were able to vote because 22 years earlier, Civil War General Benjamin Sweet, author of the founding charter of Lombard, deliberately wrote, all citizens shall be entitled to vote at any election. Weeks later, Illinois legislators effectively closed the loophole Ellen Martin used in Lombard through passage of the School Act, granting women in Illinois the legal right to vote in local school elections, but simultaneously denying them suffrage in other elections. Women in Illinois had to wait 29 years before they could vote equally with men. All citizens, the Lombard women who voted 29 years before the 19th Amendment and the story of those who made it possible. The story of women voting in Lombard 29 years before passage of the 19th Amendment has its roots in a women's suffrage movement that developed in Europe and took hold in the United States at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention where organizers began to formally advocate for the social, civil, and religious rights of women. Suffrage in America really starts publicly in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and a whole room full of Quakers had a convention where Elizabeth Cady Stanton drafted the Declaration of Sentiments which, if you read them today, remarkably, there's still a few we haven't actually succeeded on quite yet. Folks who were in the abolitionist movement attend because women will really see these as kind of linked rights issues. And of course, white women and African-American women, white women often on their own behalf. <laughs> um, some are very concerned with the rights of African-American women, some are not as concerned with the rights of African-American women. A suffragist follows the ideology of Susan B. Anthony as the leader and others who are women who want to be enfranchised to vote in the United States. And they're going to use tactics that are not necessarily going to offend the general public, but they're going to be persistent, polite, and genteel about the way they go about it. They call themselves suffragists. Kind of prominent is this moral claim for women to be able to vote that has this very mid-19th century idea that men are the head and, and women are the heart. They're asking for things like the rights to their own wages. Married women at the time, women who had the right to marry, which is primarily white women, were bound by a legal concept called coverture. So when they married, that meant that they lost their sort of um, public legal face. Things like wages, property, um, divorce, children, things like that. I think women were treated in a lot of different ways and I think a lot of it depended on whether they were married or not. Because if you were a single woman you could do a lot more things than if you were a married woman. Because once you were married you didn't have any rights to what you were doing. You were essentially working on your husband's behalf. The growth of the American women's suffrage movement and its local impact in what was to become Lombard, Illinois, was interrupted in 1861 with the outbreak of the Civil War. On October 8, 1862, the Union Army's 21st Wisconsin Regiment, under the command of Colonel Benjamin J. Sweet, found itself 100 yards in front of the left of the main line, in a position between the Union and Confederate armies. In the ensuing fight, Sweet, a 38-year-old Kirkland, New York native, took a mini ball in the right arm. The wound was serious, but Sweet survived, losing use of the limb for the rest of his life. Resigning his commission in the regular army, Sweet recovered 
and was appointed as a colonel in the Veteran Reserve Corps, also known as the Invalid Corps. On May 2, 1864, he assumed command of the Union Army's Confederate Prisoner of War Camp, Camp Douglas, on Chicago's lakefront. Camp Douglas was one of the largest military installations in uh, Illinois during the Civil War. In February 1862, it became a prison camp for Confederate prisoners. Approximately 30,000 Confederate soldiers were housed as prisoners in Camp Douglas. Benjamin Sweet was an important commander of Camp Douglas. Prior to that, he had a broad background. He came from New York to Wisconsin. He was a lawyer by profession. Uh, he served in the legislature at, uh, in Wisconsin. November 27, 1864, he became the commander of Camp Douglas. Now, he had some good things happened, good to the extent that the government was willing to spend some money to improve the facilities, even though they were way behind times to do it, bad in that there was no exchanges of prisoners. So he was faced with a group of prisoners who had three ways to get out. They could die, they could escape, which many of them tried to do, or they could sign the oath of allegiance and walk out the gate. Most of them didn't want to do that. He was a strong disciplinarian. In fact, one of the first things he said upon taking command was he gave an order to shoot to kill. He introduced what was called the Morgan Mule. Uh, the Morgan Mule was a disciplinary tool. It was, a, imagine a sawhorse that may be about 14 feet high that would hold four or five soldiers. They would straddle Morgan's mule on a two before for maybe two hours sitting there. And if they did something particularly egregious, they would tie sandbags to their legs. But the interesting thing about that was that discipline was no different than the discipline that was given to Union soldiers. So it wasn't that he was creating something solely for the Confederates. He also was a stickler for sanitation. The prisoners, many of them, absolutely despised it, but it was probably the best thing he did. He probably saved more lives than any other commander because he required the, their quarters to be swept daily, to be scrubbed weekly, and that every soldier would be bathed on Friday. And if they didn't, they'd end up on Morgan's horse. He was an interesting guy in that he didn't want to live at Camp Douglas. He lived downtown Chicago, partially because he had a young daughter with him, Ada, When the Civil War ended, Benjamin Sweet bought a farm 19 miles west of Chicago in Babcock's Grove. He resumed his law practice and was appointed by President Ulysses S. Grant to serve as the federal pension agent in Chicago. It was during this period, when he wasn't commuting into Chicago or west to the county courthouse in Wheaton, that Sweet was asked to help write the founding charter for the family's new hometown, Lombard, Illinois. After he was the commander of Camp Douglas, he bought a farm in Lombard, and he lived there right at the time that the town charter was being drafted in 1869. And he put a little chestnut in that town charter. He planted a seed in which he removed the gender of who was able to vote. It says all citizens of Lombard aged over 21 get to vote because he said all citizens and not male citizens or not white male citizens, he actually opened the door for that first vote to happen, April 6, 1891. In 1869, Chicago suburbs west of the city were beginning to draw the interest of real estate developers, especially emerging communities connected to the city by train. Towns like Oak Park, Elmhurst and Wheaton were less than an hour away. This made them ripe for development. Lombard was created as a bedroom community. It was created as this town that's growing because of its proximity 
to Chicago, but at the same time, it's far enough away. So we live out of the stinky city of Chicago. There was many people in the town that were selling and creating neighborhoods. Newell Matson was um, a jewelry designer and silversmith. And there was the Newell Matson subdivision. And he made this whole neighborhood of Charlotte, Martha, all of those uh, lovely streets that we like. Josiah Lombard was a real estate investor. You couldn't necessarily sell lots and plots unless you were incorporated. So the actual act of laying out a town, laying out the streets, taking it to Springfield and incorporating your town legally allowed people to sell property and make money as investors. The town was so happy they changed the name from Babcock's Grove to Lombard in honor of him, but yet he never spent the night here. He never lived here. We love the name, how quaint it if we were still Babcock's Grove, but in 1869, everybody was so thrilled with Josiah Lombard that they named the town after him. In 1869, the Illinois Constitution said all white males are entitled to vote. Exactly why Benjamin Sweet wrote all citizens in Lombard is a mystery. What is known for sure is that two of his daughters, Ada and Winifred, were gifted young women who would go on to achieve greatness. Ada and Winifred Sweet, I don't believe from everything I've read, everything I've researched ever took no. They just didn't. They stepped into positions that were male-driven positions. Um, and even if they were the first to ever do things, that didn't matter and didn't stop them. Ada Sweet is no doubt her dad's right hand when she's living in Camp Douglas and working with him. She sees the ins and outs of the daily operations of that camp. She sees the influences uh, politically. She sees strategy happening. She is getting a front row seat to what it's like to be a politician and to work in the government. Benjamin Sweet was not a nasty person. Certainly what he did in Lombard in the charter of the city was absolutely phenomenal by taking one word out of a portion of it. I think that really was a, I think, a tribute to Ada and to her sister, um, who were both very involved in social reform and particularly in uh, women's rights. Ada Celeste Sweet was born in Stockbridge, Wisconsin, February 23, 1853, and became one of the most noted women in American public life. She was described as being a tall, straight, lithe figure with a clear-cut, intellectual face and reddish-brown hair. In 1872, two years after the Lombard Charter was written, President Grant promoted Benjamin Sweet to first Deputy Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Sweet moved with his oldest daughter, Ada, to Washington, D.C., where she joined his office staff at the age of 19. On New Year's Day, 1874, Benjamin Sweet died following a sudden illness. Ada was forced to return to Lombard to care for her mother and four siblings, ages 18, 15, 11, and a one-year-old. The loss of Benjamin Sweet's position left the family in financial hardship. Ada's mother died in a train accident in 1878, leaving Ada as head of the household. During her time with her father in Chicago, at Camp Douglas, and in Washington, D.C., Ada Sweet had developed a commanding grasp of the government's revenue operation, and President Grant took the extraordinary step of appointing her to fill her late father's position in Chicago. Ada Celeste Sweet went on to serve four presidential administrations, resigning in 1885 to engage in business for herself. She also served as the president of the Chicago Women's Club, literary editor for the Chicago Tribune, authored and published many opinion articles, and advocated for social causes including child labor, the creation of a public ambulance service, and women's suffrage until her death in 1928. Ada Sweet was very active after she was done with her pension term. She was very much involved in sanitary commissions, in the health and, and uh, well-being of the citizens of, of Chicago. Frank Peck, 
a lifelong Lombard resident, recalled in his diary how Ada Sweet, always civic-minded and generous, had returned to Lombard for a visit and offered a Webster's Complete Dictionary to the best speller in town. The spelling bee competition was open to all. According to Peck, when the word diarrhea was given out, competitors went down like autumn leaves before a winter blast. The eventual winner correctly spelled the fitting word elemosinary, which means generosity or charity. In a 1921 speech in Santa Rosa, California, Sweet told her audience, no matter how long men of wisdom and of science advance their plans and move the world in many ways, it takes the rousing of the heart to create enough energy to do great things. Winifred Sweet was 11 years younger than her sister Ada Sweet and had a different upbringing, but had no less of an impact on what a woman could do in the United States. Winifred was a born journalist, a born storyteller. She went on to work for William Randolph Hearst at the San Francisco Examiner. Her first act uh, was pretending to faint in the streets of San Francisco so she could expose how bad the ambulance system was. There's a story about her hiding underneath um, a train car to get an interview with the President of the United States and she popped through a, a hatch on the floor in order to get in because they wouldn't let her in. She really was one of these sob sisters, a part of this yellow journalism. It wouldn't be beyond her to dress up like a little boy and uh, you know go to the Galveston flood and get a story. She was so well regarded that at her death in 1935, she is laying in state in the city rotunda because she's so well regarded and so beloved by the community. And she was certainly not afraid. She had the courage of a lion, Winifred Sweet did. In 1891, Lombard, Illinois was home to 500 souls. Yankee migrant families like the Churchills, Plums, and Pecks lived side by side with immigrant neighbors with names like Klutzmeyer, Fleggy, Marquardt, Reber, and Fisher. Wood plank sidewalks straddled muddy streets in the tiny downtown, which often flooded during spring rains. The two largest buildings, the Lombard Hotel and the First Church of Lombard, stood in contrast to miles of surrounding farmland. Records show the village treasury held a balance of $632.39 in 1891. Public education in Lombard ended after the eighth grade. Graduates had to travel miles either to Wheaton or Oak Park for high school. Lombardians were also patriotic. One resident recalled at a public meeting the reading of the Declaration of Independence. When it was discovered that no one had a printed copy, Mr. Thomas Filer rose to his feet and cited it word for word, from memory, without any hitch or error. The town of Lombard in 1891, we were around for a good 40 years. The train came through, and because the train came through in the late 1840s, there's a lot of activity happening. We didn't have one general store, we had multiple general stores. We had multiple dairy companies. We're very, very working class people, much like we are today. Lombard, at this point, is pretty well developed. Main streets, hustle, bustle, the who's who of Lombard is living on Maple Street, really is a developed community. The incorporated village of Lombard, Illinois had been in existence for 22 years in 1891, with a town charter that said all citizens can vote in any election. Yet no record exists showing that anyone other than white male citizens ever tried to vote. April 6, 1891, all that changed. One of the reasons that men and women were opposed to suffrage is it was regarded as such a public, political, 
and thus masculine thing to do. In voting, if you're a woman, you are stepping outside the sphere where you're supposed to be. I mean, even as late as 1890s, we're talking about a time when a respectable woman in public, in some public places, would lose her social respectability. And voting had long been a very sort of rowdy and public, raucous, drunken <laughs> event that was sometimes, you know, took place on the public square and people would be gambling and drinking all day long. So there were certainly women who didn't want anything to do with that kind of public culture. People might wonder why it took so long from 1869 until 1891 for women to actually vote. And really it was a matter of the right person with the right knowledge making it happen. And that was Ellen Martin. Ellen Annette Martin was born January 16, 1847 in Chautauqua County, New York, in the tiny hamlet of Keontone. The daughter of Abram and Mary Eliza Martin, Ellen's grandfather, Captain William Martin, served in the War of 1812 and was taken prisoner by the British Army when Buffalo, New York was burned in 1813. Ellen's father, Abram Martin, was an early supporter of the Republican Party, a trustee of the Universalist Society of Keontown, studied law and advocated for temperance and women's suffrage. With her father's encouragement, in 1871, Ellen began to clerk and study law with the firm of Cook and Lockwood, and then entered the University of Michigan Law School. During this period, Ellen met a fellow law student, Mary Frederica Perry. After graduation and passing the bar, Perry moved to Lombard, followed a short time later by Ellen Martin. The two women lived in a home owned by Perry's parents on Maple Street. They then began commuting into the city of Chicago on the train, setting up one of the first all-female law practices in America. Ellen Martin and Mary Perry, or M. Frederica Perry, the first all-female law practice in Chicago and probably in Illinois, maybe even wider regionally, are not only law partners having the uh, law firm of Perry and Martin in Chicago on LaSalle Street, but they're also living together in the home of Mary Perry's mother. So they're very close. These two share uh, the love of law together. For female lawyers, obtaining the suffrage was not just about the ability to vote, but to be able to practice law and argue cases because just like names are drawn for jury duty from the pool of registered voters, to argue cases in front of a court of law, you also had to be part of the electorate. And of course, women couldn't serve on juries at the time as well. Voting would open up not just the ability to vote in a presidential election or vote for governor, but um, it impacted um, women's work and their working lives. Despite being able to practice law at that time, female attorneys were restricted to bringing lawsuits or working in a law office. They could not argue a case in court, and they were not officially recognized as lawyers because of their non-status as an elector. I've been an attorney for 23 years. I'm a litigator. I walk into a courtroom all the time. I can't imagine not having that opportunity. Ellen Martin and colleagues were prevented from practicing what they loved. I can't imagine that being the case for me or for any woman to go through all that school, to go through that process and then be told to have a seat and wait till it's your turn. Despite the limitations, the firm of Perry and Martin was successful, handling cases involving real estate law and advocating for the property rights of married women. In addition to paying clients, Perry and Martin also devoted themselves to pro bono work, addressing leading social reform causes, including poverty and women's suffrage. On June 3, 1883, Ellen Martin's world was shattered when Mary Perry died at the age of 32 in their home in Lombard following a battle with pneumonia. 
M. Frederica Perry had five columns in the Chicago Legal News written about her when she had her untimely passing of pneumonia. She was absolutely beloved. She was well respected among her male peers too. So this was a huge blow to Ellen, professionally and personally. Ellen Martin never recovers from Mary Perry's death. And she changes her life and her strategy after that. In a letter, Martin blamed Perry's death on her charity work. Miss Perry's death was caused by overwork, Martin wrote. In doing a great deal of work for women for nothing, had she not been overworked, the cold she took would not have been serious. I have followed the rule since. When I have anything to give away, I will give it in money and not in legal services, except where I have a personal obligation. That personal obligation apparently presented itself a few years later in Lombard. She sat in her office and she would read law books and read things about what, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to vote? And when she would find these snips of what does it mean to be a citizen, she would write that down. She would read the town charters of different towns and different cities, and when she would find anything related to voting, she would write it down until she created an entire legal brief of the reason the women in Lombard have the right to vote, and brings it to the polling place, April 6, 1891, with two sets of spectacles on her head, the grip sack in her hand, and she announces that uh, she's here to vote. The Chicago Inner Ocean newspaper called it one shining star in the firmament of women's suffrage. After arguing with the three election judges, Martin demanded, now don't I live here? And ain't I over 21? Either read my brief or let me vote. Martin then proclaimed, I invoke the majesty of the law and demand that my vote be recorded. Judge T.H. Vance fell into a flour barrel. Judge Reber leaned up stiff, and Judge Fred Marquardt was taken with a spasm. After voting, Martin left the judges in a state of innocuous destitute and flatulence. So she votes, she leaves the polling place, um, according to the inner ocean and comes back with 14 of her friends uh, after telling them the deed is done. And they all come back and they all vote together. I don't know if anybody will ever know whether or not it was these prominent women asking Ellen Martin to work on their behalf for this election, or if it was Ellen Martin doing this and then gathering women around this idea and saying, you know what, I just voted, everybody else should vote now too. Um, the fact is those 15 women voted April 6th, 1891 in Lombard. The 14 women that voted with Ellen Martin that day, all of them were members of the First Church of Lombard. All of them except two were members of the Missionary Society. They're getting together on a monthly basis and talking about world issues. They're talking about what we're gonna do in Africa and how are they going to spread the word of God. I don't think it's a coincidence that they're all meeting weekly and it's the same women that are voting. They're related by marriage or they're related by blood. The women of society in Lombard, it's Helen Plum. Our library is still named after her, the Helen M. Plum Memorial Library. Her mother, Cynthia Williams, direct descendant of Roger Williams, who started the Rhode Island colony. Her sister-in-law, another uh, Mrs. Plum. We have Mrs. Thurston, uh, Mrs. Peterson, Miss Maria Reed, who was not married, Mary Claflin. Her son was on the village board at the time of the vote. Uh, her sister's voting, her daughter's voting. Mary Perry's mother and sister. Her mother is the great-granddaughter of a woman who voted in New Jersey in, 17, in the 1797 election. New Jersey had this very brief time where all women could vote from like 1797 to 1801. And Mrs. Latham, who now her great-granddaughter lives in Lombard, is the first woman to vote in Illinois. It's an intentional group. These are not women who just, oh, I think I'll vote today. No, this was a very intentional group. News of the vote in Lombard spread fast. The Lombard election judges quickly retreated to the county seat in Wheaton, where they huddled with Circuit Judge George W. Brown. 
the judge as, you're dumber than my pointer dog. I can't believe you let them vote. But again, they cast their vote, you let them, and the vote stood. Less than three months later, on June 19, 1891, Governor Joseph Pfeiffer signed into law Senate Bill 160, an act to entitle women to vote in local school board elections. This, in effect, meant that women were now excluded from every other election statewide. Back in Lombard, the town charter, which still said all citizens can vote, was never changed. Changing it would have required the consent of the women of Lombard. As a result, the phrase all citizens remained. The way Ellen Martin wrote her legal brief, she believed that once they voted, they would have to rewrite the charter in order for women to not be able to vote because she said, you're not taking away our citizenship. In order to change the charter, it would have had to have everybody vote to change the charter, which allowed women to vote to change the charter, and they weren't going to change the charter. When the women voted in Lombard in 1891, one of the things that resonated through the town immediately afterwards was that Lombard will now be a safer, kinder, and gentler place because it is not one voice running the government, running what's going on. Because you have all voices who can come forward and vote, it changes the community. In 1913, Illinois became the first state east of the Mississippi River to grant women the right to vote in presidential elections. In 1919, Illinois became the first state to ratify the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which gave women the right to vote in all elections. Lombard should be really proud of this legacy. Not, not many communities have stories like this that are, that are, they go to the heart of the matter. And I think they're, they're moments that we shouldn't ignore. Way to go, Alan Martin, and thank you and all of your friends for making it available to me and my girls and the women of the state of Illinois to vote. This story has implications along so many levels for women. This starts people thinking about women's enfranchisement and empowering women to make their own choices as citizens because they're all citizens. If you read through the news and you're depressed about it, <laughs> um, there's so much that needs to be done. Who you vote for does matter. It actually does, in fact, change the course of history. There's no one to tell us no. In this country, we're allowed to do things. And if we don't do them, it's not only on us. And I think that we all need to take that right that we have to vote um, or just to be a citizen and run with it and do good with it. <laughs>